chapter eight, brokerage relationships, law and practice. So the law of agency, um, this is the crux, the heart, if you will, of what it means to be in the real estate business. Um, it is super important. It's heavily tested. Just because there's a lot of material, it would be heavily tested. But it's actually what it means to be a real estate agent, specifically the word agent. So <clears throat> gonna start out with a little background. And these first several slides don't even uh, cover material that's here in the book. Um, the brokerage firm, when you hear the term brokerage firm, what we mean is we're talking about the real estate firm. And the word firm is just another word for company. So the real estate commission never uses the word company when it's talking about a real estate company, it uses the word firm. And to be really specific, firm means not only that it's a business, not only that it's a company, but also that it is a legal entity that's in business. Legal entity being a corporation, limited liability company, or partnership. Those are the three main ones. So real estate firm means is the same as real estate company, the brokerage firm. So the firm that does all the brokerage, the business of real estate can be referred to as brokerage. Okay. The brokerage firm all owns all agency contracts. And what we're going to find out that what this is all about is the relationship. You saw that on the first screen relationship, the relationship the firm has with consumers, the relationship the firm has with sellers, the relationship the firm has with buyers and what creates this relationship between them is a contract. Literally. So a good part of this is about these brokerage contracts and the brokerage contracts are between the firm and a seller, the firm and a buyer. So all agency contracts are entered into between principal, the person we represent, the person who hires the firm, and the word principal is the same as the word client and the firm. So most people recognize the word client from when you're watching a show, watching a movie, talking to somebody about attorneys. Attorneys represent their clients. And the relationship is the same in real estate an agent represents their client. All I'm showing you here is when you actually read the law, the general statute that deals with these issues. And when you actually read the real estate commission rules that deal with these issues, they never use the word client, they use the word principal. They're synonymous, they mean the same thing, but you have to get really comfortable with the word principle because that's what you're gonna see, especially on the exam. So principal and client are the same person. When I talk about a brokerage firm, 
those are a sampling of brokerage firms. Now, those are all national franchise firms, which is probably why you recognize them. Periodically, you might see one or another actually advertised on TV. So those are national franchise firms. The local companies are owned by people who buy a franchise to operate one of those locally. But there's also local firms that aren't tied to a franchise. They have nothing to do with a franchise. They're independent. Regardless, these agency contracts we're going to be talking about are between the firm and a seller, the firm and a buyer. So, the employing broker in a real estate firm, the employing broker, and in North Carolina, we call that person a broker in charge, is responsible for all contracts with the principals, with the clients. So what are these contracts we're talking about? We're talking about listing agreements with sellers. We're talking about buyer agency agreements with buyers. The broker in charge, employing broker, is responsible for supervising, in North Carolina, provisional brokers, the entry level license is called a broker on provisional status or provisional broker. In other states, they're called all kinds of things. Salesperson, sales associate, broker associate, all kinds of things. Our entry level is provisional broker. So the role of the salesperson or broker associate or provisional broker, they are employed to represent the firm and the broker in charge. They owe the same duties to the principal that the firm owes to the principal. They can be an employee, but that's not customary. Most of the time, they're an independent contractor. They're not hired as an, as an employee. And all of this will make more sense as we go through this. I think I shared with you before we went on the break, we actually won't be able to finish this with what's left in today's time. Just, and all that means is a lot of material. It takes time to cover it. But as we go through it, this will start clearing up. So to diagram out what we're talking about, at the top, employing broker or company. Under that, the responsible person or designated broker. Under that, the salesperson or broker associate. And then finally, the principals, the seller, the buyer. And you see under seller and buyer, it says listing employment agreement, buyer broker employment agreement. That's the contract I made reference to. Now, if we're talking about North Carolina specifically, the employing broker is going to be a firm, a real estate firm. Okay, do it right realty. And of course, it's going to be, you know, Century 21, Caldwell Banker, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Hathaway, Keller Williams, whatever it is, Noose Realty. And designated broker in North Carolina, we call a broker in charge. So roughly, this is the structure of a real estate firm. Now, starting at the top of 45, the laws and rules that govern the business of real estate, that govern the real estate industry. And these are state laws. 
And I emphasize that because obviously there's 50 states. There's also 50 real estate licenses. Each state has its own real estate license because each state, the laws are different from other states. Sometimes they're a lot different and sometimes they're very close or similar. But each state has its own real estate license. Each state has its own education required to get that license because each state's laws are different. Now, so this is simply a list of those laws that govern the business of real estate. And the first two, the common law of agency and the common law of contracts, those are the same everywhere. I'm going to explain in a couple of minutes what common law really is. But at this point, just suffice it to know, common law is not law written by the states. It's the same everywhere. So the common law of agency, the law that governs these agency relationships we're going to be talking about for the next couple of hours. And the common law of contracts, the law that governs how contracts are handled, no matter what the contract's for. And then we have more specific laws. We have North Carolina real estate license law. That's a North Carolina general statute that the North Carolina General Assembly wrote governing the real estate industry in our state. And we have North Carolina Real Estate Commission rules. The Real Estate Commission is the regulatory body that was created by the license law to oversee the real estate industry. And every state has a governing body. Now, what is this common law I'm talking about? Well, common law is called that, it's so named, because it was common to all the king's courts across England. So we're talking about old English common law, okay? These laws were carried into the British legal system, including its colonies. And guess what? We were a British colony. We had old, old English common law. So when we declared our independence and the Continental Congress met to write a constitution and to adopt a set of laws, they didn't see any need in reinventing the wheel. So they adopted old English common law. And see, here's the thing. We didn't break away from England because of the law. We actually broke away from England because we were not benefiting from that law. The king wasn't applying the law to us the king was making it up as he went, and that's what was unfair. That's why we broke away. So Congress adopted Old English common law as the foundation of all written laws in our country, everywhere except Louisiana. And the reason Louisiana doesn't have Old English common law is because they weren't an English colony. They were a French colony and they were already using French law and they still use French law to this day. Real estate laws in that state are very, very different than anywhere else. One obvious evidence of the difference in the laws is all the rest of the states have counties. County is a British thing. Louisiana has parishes, and that's a French thing, okay? Just one simple evidence. So old English common law is the foundation of all the rest of our laws. 
it doesn't necessarily mean that it supersedes our other laws, that it's stronger than our other laws, but it is the foundation on which everything is built. Next comes constitutional law. And finally, we get to statutory law, the laws that are written by the lawmakers, Congress federally and the states, general assemblies at the state level. But under all the law is old English common law and it's always there, it's the foundation. And I will tell you, and you're probably not gonna understand this and that's okay, you don't have to, but it is possible to lose a lawsuit while complying with state law, but having violated common law. And at some point later, I'll explain that. That's just not gonna get into it right now, but that's a fact. Okay. So agency is one of these common laws. Agency is a body of law that comes straight out of old English common law. Same thing with contracts, the way contracts are handled, the way contracts are dealt with comes out of old English common law. That's why we're talking about this. Now let's take the word agent. If you look up the word agent in a dictionary app, and I use dictionary.com, okay? Here's the definition. It's a noun. It's a person or business authorized to act on another's behalf. They give an example. Our agent in Hong Kong will ship the merchandise. A best-selling author needs a good agent. The number two definition, a person or thing that acts or has the power to act. Now, if I look up the word broker, it's similar, but it's not the same. An agent who buys or sells for a principal, that's the person they represent, on a commission basis without having title to the property. A person who functions as an intermediary between two or more parties in negotiating agreements, bargains, or the like, and then the example they give is stockbroker. It could be real estate broker. So the topic we're covering is agency, okay? It is in the very nature of our business, real estate brokers, our business that we are real estate agents. The real estate business is vastly different than most other businesses because of this agency concept, okay? Why are we called real estate agents? Because we represent principles. We represent clients, not because we sell property, because we don't sell property, okay? Actually, there is something we do sell, not property. Anyone like to hazard a guess at what it is we do sell? Ourselves and our firms. That's what we sell. That's the competitive part of, of real estate. You know, when, when I go on a listing appointment, I'm almost never the only agent going on a, on a listing appointment. They have invited two, three, four other, other agents from other real estate firms. That's the in, in competitive nature of the business. So when I'm on those appointments, I'm selling myself and I'm selling my firm. The idea of it. But other than that, I don't sell anything. Agency is the fiduciary relationship that exists when one person is authorized to act on behalf of another. 
So in way of thinking about this, trying to get you in the right frame of mind, so to speak, I'm going to give you examples of agents in other industries, in other lines of work, because we're not the only industry that uses agents. Okay. Professional sports agent. Brady doesn't negotiate his own contract. He has an agent that does that for him. And when the contract's agreed upon and signed, his agent makes a commission, a percentage of the contract. That agent's responsibility is to negotiate that contract on behalf of that sports figure. And every professional sports figure has an agent. And, you know, you watch the games and you hear them mention agent. And I suspect most people, when they hear that word, they really don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what the individual talking about the agent is actually saying. But that's what it is. An actor, Tom Cruise, N name any actor you can think of. They all have an agent. They don't negotiate their own contracts. They have an agent that negotiates their contract for them. And when the contract is signed, the agent makes a commission, a percentage of whatever amount was agreed to. That's what an agent is. Literary agent. And this was actually in, in the definition in the dictionary.com. Professional author needs a good agent, it said. Nicholas Sparks, Clancy. None of these people negotiate their own contracts. They have an agent that negotiates it for them. J.K. Rowling as an agent. Insurance agents. They are called an agent because they represent a principal, a client. So who do insurance agents represent? The insurance company. Yes, the insurance company, not us. That's a fact. That's why they're an agent. It's also why they're always affiliated with just one insurance company. They're an agent of State Farm. They're an agent of Farm Bureau. They're an agent of Nationwide. They are not on our side. They are on the insurance company's side. That's a fact. So when I file a claim or you file a claim and we're not happy with how it's being paid and we complain, the guy we're complaining to or the woman we're complaining to is working for the company that won't, let, won't pay the claim. So, you know, when they put their arm around your shoulder and commiserate and empathize and sympathize, that's all BS. They're blowing smoke. That's what BS means, by the way, blowing smoke. Because they represent the company that won't pay the claim. Now, I picked this ad very deliberately because this is a very unusual insurance ad. You know why? Because it points it out. Representing top quality insurance providers. That's very rare. You want to see somebody squirm? You want to have some fun? The next time you're in the presence of whoever you buy insurance from, ask them who their client is. Ask them who they represent. And you will see somebody squirm because they hate talking about it.
They really do. And they don't have to tell us. And see, this is interesting. As a real estate agent, I have to tell everybody who I represent. I have to tell everybody who my client is. And I even have to do it in writing. But an insurance agent doesn't have to say a word. Why is that, do you think? So why do you think I have to disclose to everybody who I represent? Anybody like to hazard a guess? To gain their trust. Well, that's a good reason to do it, but that's not why I'm required to do it. I'm required by law. If I don't disclose who I represent to people, I break the law. So now let me go back and ask the first question. Why don't insurance agents tell us who they represent? Because it's not law. Because there's no law. They're not required to, so they're not going to. And there never will be a law. There will never be a law requiring that because they are the strongest industry in the country, the strongest lobby in the country. Every four years, we get this big argument about insurance and who's going to get elected. And it's the biggest joke in the world because the insurance industry controls the insurance. That's where most of the money you borrow to buy a house comes from, you know. Because it does. We'll learn that in finance. I know you're thinking, no, I borrowed it from Bank of America. Well, where do you think B of A gets its money from? All right. So if you would like to buy insurance, and if you don't want to work with somebody that represents one insurance company, you want to deal with an insurance broker. Because they will represent you and not the insurance company. And there are insurance brokerages around. A couple of big ones here in New Bern. They can find you insurance with any insurance company. They're not tied to one company. They find you the best deal for the kind of insurance you want. They represent the consumer buying the insurance. FBI agent. What does the word agent have to do with law enforcement? CIA agent. What does the word agent have to do with being a spy? Because the word agent after FBI means the same thing it means after real estate. It means they represent a principal. And their direct principal is the FBI as an entity, their indirect principal is the federal government. Attorneys. The attorney-client privilege you hear so much about on the news. Their attorney-client privilege relationship fiduciary comes from the same exact common law a real estate agent does. There's only one law of agency. So when you hire an attorney, the attorney is acting as your agent and you are their principal under the same common law. So what we're working toward is when you become a real estate broker and you represent sellers and buyers, this is the relationship you will have with those sellers and buyers, just like an attorney representing a client, exact same relationship. 
If you thought you were getting into sales, you're in the wrong business. Go sell cars. They don't have clients. There's no agency involved. Go sell washing machines. So what is it real estate agents really do? Real estate agents represent sellers and buyers in complex financial transactions that up to that point in their lives typically involves the largest amount of money they've ever invested. People are going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, based on your advice. And you can make a lot of money doing that. You make a lot more money than selling cars, but it's a different business. What does this word represent mean? I've, I've probably used that 30 times since we came back from break. Represent means look out for the client's interest above all others. Represent means protect the client. Represent means tell the clients what they need to hear. Represent means you stand in the place of the client. Now, go back to the top. Represent, look out for the client's interest above all others, including yours, including the agents. Represent means protect the client. Who do you frequently have to protect them from? Themselves. Themselves, themselves absolutely. Let me ask you something. Isn't that the reason they use a real estate agent? You don't need a real estate agent to buy and sell property. You can buy and sell property by yourself all day long. You don't have to have a license to buy and sell property. But 94% of people that do buy and sell residential property use a real estate agent. because they don't know how to do it. And even when they use us frequently, they want to do things that are going to hurt themselves and we have to stop them. No, you really don't want to do that. Let me explain why. Represent means tell a client what they need to hear. What's the rest of the sentence? Not what they want to hear. Not what they want to hear. And here's the thing. Everybody wants to be told what they want to hear. Everybody. Everybody wants to be told they're right, even when they're wrong. And I'm serious about that. But if we just stand back and let them do what they want to do, they will hurt themselves, injure themselves. They'll cost themselves money. They'll lose the house, whatever's going on. See, that's what the job is. Acting as somebody's agent. Represent means also old car. It's an acronym. We'll get to it. So, agency. This is under basic agency terms. Uh, under the pyramid, the four point bullet reads law of agency, basic concepts, and then basic agency terms. You see the word agency. Agency is the consensual. Consensual means both parties agree. Fiduciary relationship that exists when one person is authorized to act on behalf of another. So this is similar to the first diagram. You have the real estate firm. And the reason in the box 
with firm, I have the word agent is because the firm is actually the agent. When we said the real estate firm holds all the contracts, owns all the contracts, the listing contracts, buyer agency contracts, the agreement between the consumer is not with the individual agent, it's with the real estate firm. If you've ever hired a real estate agent, okay, either because you were selling your house and you asked an agent to list it or because you wanted to buy a house and you asked the agent to help you find a house or both, either way, you actually did not hire that individual person at all. And the truth is, if you read the listing agreement or read the buyer agency agreement, it explains that right in the first paragraph and you'd know it. You hired the firm. You hired Century 21 or Caldwell Banker or Keller Williams or Berkshire Hathaway's, whoever, Remax. Now under the firm, we have somebody in charge in North Carolina, we call that individual a broker in charge. And then we have the people who are in the firm, the real estate brokers who are in the firm. And if the firm's the agent, that makes them the sub-agent. You want to build a house, you hire a general contractor. The people who do the framing and the people who do the brick and the people who do the plumbing and the people who do the electrical, they're all what? subcontractors, same exact thing. You don't hire all those individuals. You hired the general contractor and the general contractor hired the subcontractors. That's exactly what happens in real estate. The firm is the general contractor. All the brokers affiliated in the firm are subcontractors. Only we call them sub-agents because they're the firm's the agent, they're under the agent. And if you can keep that in your head, you now understand agency. But I'm serious. If you've ever listed your home or ever worked with a buyer as a buyer's agent, pull out the contract with them. The first paragraph explains to you what I just explained to you. You did not hire them. You hired their company. And it's in that first paragraph. Principal or client is the person that hires a firm, the agent, to act on their behalf. The principal can be a seller, a buyer, or an owner of rental property. Seller hires a firm to find buyers. Buyer hires a firm to find property. Owner of rental property hires a firm to manage their rentals for them. And the agent is the firm that acts for or on behalf of another by virtue of an agency agreement. The agent is the firm. not the individual broker. This is a little video that kind of explains what I just went through. It's just a way you can hear it in a different way. Ah, relationships. Can't live with them, can't live without them, especially in real estate. So it's probably a good idea to understand how your relationships to people change based on the legal relationship that gets created when you represent someone as an agent. But before we can get into the different types of relationships, you must know what it is to be a fiduciary. A fiduciary duty legally obligates one person to act solely in the interest of another person. So a fiduciary is the person that knowingly accepts that obligation. A fiduciary agrees to always put their client's best interest first. Which brings us to another important point, understanding the difference between a customer, client, and principal. 
The differences are subtle but important. A customer is an interested party who might be dealing with an agent, but who is not being represented by the agent. There is no fiduciary duty owed to the customer. That being said, a customer can still expect an agent to provide honest and fair dealing, which is just smart business anyway, since dishonesty during a transaction can be a basis for litigation from the customer. Clients and principals get confused for a good reason. But here is a secret. They're the same thing. Many people hear the two terms and think, well, they must be different relationships because they have different names. But nope, just like pancakes and flapjacks or sprinkles and jimmies, it's the same thing with a different name. Becoming a client means you have an agency relationship with an agent. And now that agent has a fiduciary responsibility to you. This means the agent is expected to exercise discretion when acting on your behalf and they must adhere to very specific responsibilities and standards of acting in good faith and loyalty. Let's put this in real world terms. Say you get a listing. The seller is your client, so now you owe that seller a fiduciary duty. Potential buyers of that property are your customer. So you must be fair and honest with them, but you do not have a fiduciary duty to them because you are looking out for the best interest of the seller. In some transactions, the seller and the buyer might both be represented by the same agent. This is known as a dual agency. Different states have different laws regarding dual agency, so be sure to check with your local jurisdiction before doing a transaction this way. Even when it is permitted, most people prefer not to work with dual agents because there is a natural conflict of interest. The agent is trying to be fair to both sides in the transaction, but because they are in the middle and must remain neutral, dual agents are effectively not working on behalf of either party. Now that we got the sticky business of dual agents out of the way, there are a few other types of agents you'll hear about while studying for the exam. Special agents, general agents, and universal agents. Special agents are hired to perform one specific duty for the client. This is the standard agency relationship for an accountant who does your taxes, as well as a real estate agent who helps you through a transaction. A real estate agent's authority is limited to one specific task. When you get a listing, for example, you are hired for the one act of finding a buyer for the listed property. Once that act is complete, the agency relationship ends. You are authorized to perform one act, so you were a special agent. General agents can perform any and all acts associated with the principal's ongoing business that the agent has been appointed to act in. Whew, that was a mouthful, but it sounds more complex than it is. Basically, this just means that the agency relationship is continuous and ongoing, like a property manager. The relationship ends when the contract ends or by mutual agreement. Finally, we have universal agents. These are the superheroes of agency relationships with full authority to act on behalf of a principal. Many times, universal agents will have a power of attorney to act on their principal's behalf. Universal agents can, in a sense, act like they are the principal. They can even sign legal documents and purchase or sell property for them. Universal agents are powerful but rare. Like superheroes, there aren't very many of them. I hope that helps you understand some basics of agency relationships. Okay. So I talked about the introductory paragraph of the agency agreements. This is the introductory paragraph in the exclusive right to sell listing agreement. Now, I actually typed it because if I just copied the form, it'd be so small, you wouldn't be able to read it on the screen. But this is what it says. This exclusive right to sell listing agreement is entered into between, and the first line is the sellers, the people that own the house, as sellers of the property described below. And the next blank line is for the real estate firm. And you see after the blank, it says as listing firm. So it's going to be Prudential, Caldwell Banker, Remax, Keller Williams, Century 21, pick a name. Not Roy Farron. Okay, I go out and take a listing. I'm not taking the listing for myself. I'm taking it for my firm. My name doesn't go on it. 
And now it explains that. The individual agent who signs this agreement shall, on behalf of the firm, be primarily responsible for ensuring that the firm's duties here under are fulfilled. However, it is understood and agreed that other agents of the firm may be assigned to fulfill such duties if deemed appropriate by the firm. For purposes of this agreement, the term firm, as the context may require, shall be deemed to include the individual agent who signs this agreement and any other agents of the firm. So literally, I'm on a listing appointment. They agree to list with my firm, okay? Put their information on it, fill it out. They sign it. I sign it as a representative of the firm. They are listing with my firm and everybody in the firm. So if there's 140 agents in the firm, they're listing with 140 agents. Legally, that's how it works. And the only place I get to put my name on this form is at the end where I sign it. Not with me, it's with my firm. <clears throat> so the agent as fiduciary, as stated by the North Carolina Real Estate Commission, Persons who act in positions involving a special relationship of trust, such as guardians, executors, attorneys, and brokers. And that's a quote out of the North Carolina Real Estate Manual, which is a reference manual printed and published by the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. It's not a textbook. Subagent. The firm is the agent. The individual broker is the subagent representing the firm. The individual broker is the agent of the firm, which makes him a subagent of the principal. Again, just like the description of general contractor and subcontractor, same relationship. So go back to the same dictionary app and look up subagent. Definition of subagent, a subordinate agent. The word subordinate means you're under somebody. Who am I under? I'm under the firm, the agent. A subordinate agent, an agent such as a real estate broker who is authorized by another agent to act in that person's place. In a subagency, the selling broker is a subagent of the seller because the selling broker derives his or her authority from the listing broker. That last part's a little confusing the way they worded it. But this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the relationship between a real estate firm and a consumer. And that relationship is created with these contracts. So sub-agent, the firm directly represents the principal or client. The firm is the agent of the principal or client, while the broker affiliated with the firm directly represents the firm and indirectly represents the principal on behalf of the firm. And we call that sub-agency. The licensee is the sub-agent. They're under the agent. This diagram's on the bottom of 46, pretty simplistic. So if I'm gonna diagram this myself, okay, a real estate firm takes listings. They have listing contracts with seller, principal, or client. They're the agent of the seller. That same firm enters into buyer agency agreements with buyer clients. The firm is the agent of those buyer clients. All of the affiliated brokers. Now, I put four on the screen 
only because they didn't want to clutter up the screen. I have been affiliated with the firm that had 144 agents when I left them. So I can put 144 of those little boxes on there. So whenever the firm took a listing or got a, a buyer client, all 144 brokers in the firm represented those sellers and those buyers. The firm is the agent. All of the affiliated brokers are the sub-agent. The firm is the contractor. All the affiliated brokers are subcontractors. Same thing. Now, the firm I'm with now as broker in charge, we only have eight agents. It's a startup new firm. So I still have eight boxes under there. The firm is the principal's agent by a contract. Listing agreement with sellers, buyer agency agreement with buyers, property management agreements with owners of rental property. Now, I have listing agreement and parentheses contracts. So let me explain this. The word agreement and the word contract are synonyms. They mean the exact same thing. If you look both those words up, they have the exact same definition. They are synonyms. When the Real Estate Commission is talking about these contracts, the Real Estate Commission calls them contracts because they're contracts. When the people that print the forms we use on those forms, they call it an agreement. And I've already told you, it means the same thing. Why do you think on the printed paper, they use the word agreement instead of contract? Oh, because it sounds better and more soothing. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's less threatening, okay? Even though it means the exact same thing. See, most people don't take it that way. Just, I want to clarify that. So the firm is hired by sellers through a listing agreement, by buyers through a buyer agency agreement, by landlords, owners of rental property, through a property management agreement. Now, the broker, the individual licensee, you, after you get your license, or me, the broker is the firm agent by contract. The contract of affiliation you will sign when you join a firm, because you will sign a contract. Most firms, and I mean most, hire brokers, hire the agents that work for them as an independent contractor, not employees. So to become an independent contractor, you have to sign a contract. Third party or customer is the party to the transaction the firm does not represent. So if you're the listing agent, if you took this listing for your firm, the third party or customer would be the, the buyer. If on the other hand, you're a buyer agent, the third party or customer would be a seller. It's the party in the transaction that your firm and you do not represent. See, when you walk in a retail store, everybody that walks through the door is a customer. And everybody knows that. There's no reason for anybody to explain that. You drive on a car lot. Everybody that drives on a car lot's a customer. Nobody has to explain that. 
and you feel like a customer when the 38 salesmen that are on duty charge. There's no agency relationships there. The agent, the firm works for a client with a customer. There's a difference in those words. Okay. You work for a client. The client is your boss. They hired you with a contract. But a customer you have no relationship with. You just work with them. And this diagram near the top of 47 is meant to convey that. You represent the principal. You have no relationship with the third party. Now, in some states, you can act as a facilitator or transactional broker, okay? So in those states, this is a real estate licensee who provides service without acting as an agent, without representing either party. North Carolina does not recognize, nor does North Carolina permit this kind of practice. They don't allow facilitation or transactional brokerage. We cannot be a neutral facilitator. We have to have a client under North Carolina law. Some states, you can be neutral. Three levels of agency. Now, the three levels of agency were mentioned in that little video we watched. Okay. Universal agent can do anything the principal can do. This is the highest. Any business, any kind. And that means literally. They can sell everything the person owns. Real property, stocks, bonds, certificates, everything they own. They can buy those things in the person's name. They can do any business. Can only be created by a power of attorney or a court order. So an example would be when somebody's declared incompetent and a court assigns a guardian. Typically that guardian's a universal agent. General agency. The agent is authorized to perform a broad range of acts in connection with the principal's business, can be created by a power of attorney. However, there's also a real estate professional who regularly practices general agency, and that's the property manager. And that's because property management lasts long times. It's not getting paid when the transaction closes. The property manager gets paid every single time a tenant pays the rent. They get a piece of it. Over a year, five years, 10 years. So because of this expansive period of time, it's a higher level of agency. As a matter of fact, in some states, they're not called property managers. They're called general agents. Now, they have more authority too, okay? They can execute contracts binding the client without the client's signature. Leases, they execute leases. They can institute legal actions on behalf of the client. They can file for summary ejectment in small claims court before a magistrate. Maybe most notably, they can spend the client's money. If I did eat any of those three things in a sales transaction, I'd be looking for a new job because I'd lose my license. Now, on the national section of the licensing exam, an affiliated broker is the general agent of a firm. So they're saying some states the relationship between the real estate firm and the broker that joins that firm, they call that general agency. 
<clears throat> that brings us to special agency. The firm is authorized to do specific acts on behalf of the principal in accordance with detailed instructions. And this is the agency relationship that exists in the typical real estate sales transaction. We are not supposed to do anything on our own. Now we are supposed to suggest things to do, to tell the client things they ought to be taken care of, or that we're gonna do for them, but we're not supposed to act on our own initiative. Special agency. And you've got this diagram on the top of 48. Just another way of looking at the same thing. <clears throat> Levels of agency. The next four point bullet right under the, the pyramid, creating agency relationships. Now I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but here you're actually seeing it. So creating agency relationships between firms and consumers, between a firm and a seller, between a firm and a buyer. Agency agreements, this is how we do it. Agency agreements create the agency relationship between firm and principal, between the agent and client, and establishes the agent's authorities and responsibilities. It establishes the scope of the relationship. Listing contracts with sellers, buyer agency contracts with buyers, property management contracts with the owners of rental property. That's what creates the fiduciary relationship. Now, creating agency relationships this time between firms and brokers. This is the second arrow bullet there. Contracts create the agency relationship between the firm and the individual broker, between the agent and the subagent, and establishes the subagent's authority and responsibilities. It's the employment contractor between contract between the real estate firm and the real estate broker frequently referred to as a contract of affiliation. Now, the real estate firms themselves sign a similar contract when they draw, join the multiple listing system. They sign a contract that says they're gonna cooperate with the other firms. And when earned, they will pay the other firms, share compensation. Authority can be expressed. It means out in the open. Now, we saw the word express and implied last week talking about easements, how they were created. Okay. The word express means out in the open, written or oral. And anything legal, anything to do with real estate should be in writing. implied based on custom or the actions of the agent. Quite literally, no words are used. So this is the definition of a legal website. Implied authority is inferred or conferred by custom 
Agents' position are what is reasonably necessary to carry out express authority. What the agent reasonably thinks the principal means. And the second sentence, you can actually flip around. What the principal reasonably thinks the agent means. Since no words are used, everybody has to kind of guess what's going on. That's the problem with implied. Apparent authority. Apparent authority refers to a situation where a reasonable person would understand that an agent had authority to act, even though the agent had no actual authority, either expressed or implied. In other words, it appears to the third party that the agent has the authority, but even though he doesn't. Only way to understand this one is for me to give you a little ex example. Let's say I'm a property manager and one of my clients owns 12 rental homes and she has executed a property management agreement with me and hired me to manage her 12 rental homes. She also owns a four unit apartment building in downtown New Bern, but that's not in my contract. I know it's there, I just, I don't deal with that. It's not what she hired me for. I get a prospective tenant for one of the vacant rental homes and I show it to them and they like it. The problem is they can't afford it. The rent's too high. But I happen to know one of the apartments downtown is available and it's much cheaper. So I take them and show it to them. And they love it and they rent it. And I execute a lease with them. Now, I had no authority to do that. The apartment building is not in my property management contract. So, does my principal, the owner, have to honor that lease? Yes. Because the tenant entered the lease with good faith. To that tenant, it appeared I had the authority to do what I did, even though I didn't. That's apparent authority. Now, the owner, what wouldn't she have to do? She has to honor the lease with these people, and she's gonna be happy there's a tenant anyway, but what doesn't she have to do? Sign another contract. She's got to pay me. See, because I get paid through my contract and that property is not in the contract. She doesn't have to give me a penny. Because I don't have a contract to lease the, the apartments. Now she could, or instead of giving me the property management, see property managers get paid every time the tenant pays rent. So a property manager might get paid for 20 years. It depends on how long they're the property manager. So she doesn't have to pay me anything because I didn't have a contract to lease the, the apartment. Or she could say, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a $250 finder's fee because I'm not entitled to get paid anything. because my agency relationship is only for the rental homes. And you've got this diagram. Actually, that one's not in your book. Not with the apparent. But you do have this one. So actual authority, specific powers granted to the agent, express principal grants agent orally or in writing, implied. Principal intends agent to have those powers. Apparent, principal's actions result in a third party believing agent had the authority. 
Now this came from a legal site also. And the only comment I'll make about this graphic, see the word they put under a parent? Only an attorney could possibly think you could explain the word apparent with the word ostensible. Just saying. Basic agency relationship. Consumer employs a sole practitioner broker or consumer employs a real estate firm. So the only time a consumer actually hires a sole practitioner broker, that means the broker is working alone, independently. They're either not affiliated with the firm or they are the firm. The whole kit and caboodle, the whole shabam, the whole ball of wax. I'm running out of things to say. So, to fully understand agency, I think it helps to understand where this came from. The agency that we practice regularly today, where did it come from? So in the real estate industry, you will occasionally hear people who have been around long enough to know about it, and I'm included in one of those, talk about the old way. Traditional agency or the old way. And in the old way, all real estate firms and all real estate licensees always represented all the sellers. I want you to wrap your brain around that for a minute. All firms all licensees always represented all the sellers. What I'm telling you is it didn't matter what real estate firm the seller was listed with. That was irrelevant. So if I'm a Century 21 agent, I represented the Caldwell Banker sellers and the Remax sellers and the Prudential sellers. I represented all sellers regardless of what firm they listed with. That's the way it used to be. That's the old way. And that worked through the multiple listing system. The, the agency relationship was actually, the whole thing was through the MLS, multiple listing system. When they were working with buyers, they were still working for the seller. A buyer could not hire a firm. A back then, the buyer could not hire an agent. Seller was a client, buyer was a customer, always. So even when I had a couple in my car, buyers in my car showing them property, I still represented all the sellers and those buyers were customers. Neither my firm nor I had any fiduciary relationship to the customer, to the buyer. Now I want you to think about that because this is what it means. When that buyer asks me, Roy, what should I offer? So I've shown them a bunch of homes and they pick one out. They say, Roy, this is the one we want. I say, cool, let's go back to the office. We'll write it up. And when I sit down and write up that offer for them and they ask me, what should I offer? Because that's the first question buyers always ask. Whether it was 30 years ago or whether it's today, it's still the first question they always ask. In other words, the house is listed for 150, what should I offer? Now, in the crazy market we have today, and the house is listed for 150 and asked, what should we offer? We say 200. Okay, but that's not normal. And this market will come to an end sometime. So, you know, I'm thinking normal real estate market where things usually sell just a little bit under list price. But regardless, 
When that buyer asked me, what should I offer? My answer had to be full price. Because if I told them anything other than full price, I broke the law. It was illegal. Because my client was the seller, regardless which seller it was, and my duty to the seller is to get them full price. Now, when the buyer asked me, I didn't blurt full price out at them. I would say something like, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, as far as I know, the seller is firm on getting full price. However, I will write up whatever you want to offer. Because I would. And see, I told them full price. More politely, but I told them full price. And I will write up whatever they want to offer. Because I don't care. The only person that cares how much the offer is, is the seller. And the reason the seller cares is because they don't understand the business. Because if they understood the business, they wouldn't care either. Yes, I'm serious. It doesn't matter what a buyer offers. What matters is where you end up after a negotiation. And see, if you can't get the offer, the house isn't going to sell no matter what. You have to get an offer. So I didn't care at any rate. And I had to tell them it was full price because my client was the seller, not them. They were customers, just like people who drove on a car lot. Now, I'm going to carry this a step further. Just like insurance agents today, I did not have to tell them who I represented. I did not have to explain to them that I represented the seller. Because back then there was no law requiring that. Now we couldn't mislead them. You know, I couldn't say things that would lead them to believe I was representing them. That was illegal, unethical, everything. But I didn't have to tell them. So the problem was most buyers didn't know we represented the seller. Most buyers thought we were their agent. Just like most people to this day that buy insurance from an insurance agent think the insurance agent represents them. Not because the insurance agent says that, they just assume it. Now, July 1, 1995, everything changed. This isn't in the book. You don't need the date for the test. I'm just giving you a timeline here. So I got in the business in early 1993. I worked this way, the old way, a little over two years. So I understand it because I did it. July 1, 1995, everything changed in real estate. The reason is July 1 is because that's when our license year starts. Our license year runs July 1 to June 30. At any rate, July 1, 1995, the North Carolina General Assembly passed a law making it possible to act as a buyer's agent. That same day, they also passed a law requiring written disclosure of agency relationship. So starting that day, we had to tell everybody who we represented and it had to be done in writing. The buyer agency started that day. And of course, when I say buyer agency started, so did Duel. It came with it. So everything changed. So how do firms do it today? How do firms practice agency today? 
They have three choices. Exclusive seller agency, or you could say seller agency only, or the exact opposite of that, which is exclusive buyer agency or buyer agency only, or they can offer both forms of agency at the same firm. They can offer seller agency and they can offer buyer agency at the same firm. So let's talk about these. Exclusive seller agency or seller agency only. The firm will take listings and always represent sellers. These firms will never represent buyers. What's this sound like? That should sound familiar to you. What's that sound like? It's the old way. That's exactly what I just told you the old way was, right? It is the old way and it's perfectly legal, provided, provided the buyer knows what's going on. And we call that disclosure. So firms can still do this as long as they disclose to the buyer they're doing it, okay? The firm will only work with buyers as an agent of the seller. The firm is always practicing single agency, buyer agency. Therefore, this kind of firm never gets into dual agency. Now, I don't know of a firm that does this. I didn't say there isn't one. I said, I don't know of one. There might be some little firm up in the far reaches of the North Carolina mountains somewhere that does this, but I don't know about it, but it's legal, okay? So you see the graphics there on the bottom of 49, you've got the real estate company, you've got one of the affiliated agents who's listing property, seller agent, you've got the clients, the sellers are the client. Any buyers they bring are customers. The buyers are on their own. So this is still a situation if it happened and the buyer said, what should I offer? The answer is full price. Write up whatever you want, but the seller wants full price. Diagram it out. The firm takes listings. The firm has seller clients, and that's through the listing agreement or contract. The firm is the agent of the seller clients because of the listing agreement. All of the affiliated brokers, whether it's 440 or 400, are also sub-agents of those seller clients because of their contracts with the firm, their contracts of affiliation. The buyers are customers. Just like a customer that walks in a store or a customer that drives on a car lot, they're on their own. That's exclusive seller agency or seller agency only. The next is the exact opposite. Exclusive buyer agency. The firm will always represent buyers. The firm will never represent sellers. Now, if this firm never represents sellers, what don't they do? Miss houses. That's correct. They do not take listings, none. Okay. They never take listings. Therefore, again, they're never practicing dual agency. The firm is always practicing single agency. 
Now, there are some firms doing this, not a lot, for about, oh, maybe 16, 17 years, there was a broker down in Oriental that owned a firm and she practiced exclusive buyer agency. She took pre-license from me. She took post-license from me. She periodically would take CE from me, Carol Wright. The only reason she's not doing it now, she finally retired. She actually tried to retire for, I don't know, maybe as much as five years. Yeah. We'd meet every year. She'd tell me, yeah, I'm going to retire this year. And she could never retire. She had too much business. <laughs> she wanted to give it up. Okay. So it can be done. But only a handful of people do it this way. So we've got XYZ properties and their buyer's agent with buyer clients. And XYZ is an exclusive buyer agency, so they don't take listings. So to XYZ, sellers are customers. They have no relationship with the sellers they write offers on. The sellers are on their own. If I diagram it myself, it's gonna look like this. The firm through a buyer agency agreement becomes the agent of the buyer principals or clients. All the affiliated brokers share that relationship through the firm with the buyer clients, so they're sub-agents. And the sellers are customers to these, this firm. This firm has no relationship with the customers, with the, with the sellers. Exclusive buyer agency. Now, what most firms choose to do is to offer both forms of agency at the same firm, both seller and buyer agency. The firm will represent sellers, they take listings. The firm will represent buyers, they enter into buyer agency agreements. That in and of itself does not create dual agency. The firm will only be in dual agency when one of their affiliated brokers takes a buyer the firm represents to a seller the firm also represents. In other words, one of their own listings. <laughs> Then, and only then, is the firm actually practicing dual agency. So the firm has listing agreements with sellers. They have seller principles. And the firm has buyer agency agreement with buyers. The, the firm has buyer principles. And they can work with those seller clients and those buyer clients. And as long as they never get them together, there's no dual agency. But if that buyer client becomes interested in one of the firm's listings, then the firm and all the agents in the firm become dual agents representing both the seller and the buyer at the same time. That's dual agency. So doing business this way sometimes results in dual agency, not all the time. Sometimes a buyer from a different firm buys one of our listings or sometimes I take a buyer to another firm's listing. So it's not always dual agency, but some of the time. So intentional, deliberate, disclosed dual agency. The firm and all its affiliated agents represent both the seller and the buyer 
in the same real estate sales transaction. The buyer and the seller are together in the same sales contract. That's when it's dual agency. That's dual agency. Now, usually, one of the firm's affiliated brokers has the seller, and one of the firm's affiliated brokers has the buyer. It's not the same individual broker. Now, I told you one firm I was with had 140 agents. I'm now affiliated with a firm that has eight agents. Either way, most of the time, dual agency involves two of the firm's brokers. It's dual agency because remember, the relationship isn't with the individual broker, the relationship's with the firm. See, that's the key. The listing agreement's with the firm, the buyer agency agreement's with the firm. So most of the time, it's two different brokers in the same firm. One has a seller, one has a buyer, that's dual agency. Occasionally, rarely, one of the firm's affiliated brokers has both at the same time. It happens, but not as often. Either way, the firm and all its agent acts as a fiduciary for both the seller and the buyer. The firm must have prior informed written consent of both principals for the dual agency. And they give that in the agency agreements. The seller gives permission for dual agency in the listing agreement and the buyer gives permission for dual agency in the buyer agency agreement. The firm and all its agents lose the ability to advocate for either principal. Once they're in a dual agency relationship, they can't advocate for either side. If either broker in a dual agency advocates, advises, argues for, negotiates on behalf of one principal, that would injure or harm the other principal, and you can't do that. So that would violate the firm's fiduciary duties to the injured principal. Under North Carolina real estate license law, a dual agent, the firm, remember, the firm owes all fiduciary duties to both of the firm's clients without injury to either. Now, I know what the words mean. I can read them and understand them. I know what the words mean. But how do you do that? How do you serve two masters at the same time? See, that's what dual agency is. If I was going to picture the position that puts the agents in, here's what I envision. One mistake and you might fall off the road. Just my way of showing it. That's disclosed dual agency. Now, so you've got one firm, two agents in the firm. One of them has the seller and one of them has the buyer. Both the seller and the buyers are clients. The firm and all affiliated brokers are dual agents representing both. Now, here's the hard part. This is the part you got to wrap your brain around. You see this woman here on the phone? She took the listing, but now she's a dual agent. What that means is this woman also represents these buyers. And this woman here, who's been working with the buyers as a dual agent, she also represents these sellers. That's what dual agency means.
the firm and all 140 agents, all eight agents, however many agents are in the firm, represent both clients equally. Same fiduciary. So if you favor one, you injure the other. In other words, if you're the agent that took the listing, at the point the offer comes in, you can't tell your seller what to counter offer. Or if you've got the buyer, you can't tell your buyer what to counter offer. You can give them information. You can do a market analysis on the property and show them the comps, but you can't tell them what to do. You lose that when you go into dual agency. So unintentional, undisclosed dual agency. This is a firm that's in dual agency and nobody knows it. And yes, this happens. Okay. The individual agent fails to disclose what their agency relationship is with one party or the other party or both parties. Is always unlawful about the worst legal shape you can get in because you can't defend it. Now, there's one additional step to this agency. And this is designated dual agency. Now, I, I shared with you, and I, I already told you, you don't need to remember this, but I shared with you that buyer agency or, yeah, buyer agency and consequently dual agency started in 1995. We didn't get designated then. We didn't get designated till three years later in 1998. Now, we don't care now because we're in 2022. I'm just, again, trying to give you this timeline. So designated dual agency. <clears throat> Only firms that offer both seller and buyer agency can offer designated agency because it is, in fact, an optional form of dual agency. Optional means the company has the choice whether to do it or not. Whether to even offer designated dual agency or not. So the way designated dual agency works is the broker in charge designates one sub-agent to exclusively represent only the seller. And that'll be the agent that's working on with the seller already. Don't bring new agents in to do this. They designate the agents already working with these people. So the broker in charge designates one sub agent to exclusively represent only the seller. And the broker in charge designates one sub agent to exclusively represent only the buyer. The firm and all of the rest of the licensees in the firm remain dual agents representing both of the firm's clients. So the only agents affected by the designated dual agency are the agents actively working with the two principals, the seller and the buyer. The firm itself and the other 138 agents in the firm are dual agents representing both equally. Their agency relationship doesn't change, they're dual. So the firm has listing agreements with seller clients. The firm represents those seller clients. The firm has buyer agency agreements with buyer clients. The firm represents those buyer clients. The buyer clients become interested in one of the firm's listings that puts the firm and everybody in the firm 
into dual agency immediately with the prior written permission of the clients, the broker in charge designates one sub-agent to represent only the seller and one sub-agent to represent only the buyer. The firm and all the rest of the people in the firm are still dual agents representing both. So when this happens, those two agents that have been designated can act as if they're in separate firms. They're not, but they can act that way. Designated dual agency, a firm practicing dual agency and designated dual agency must give full written disclosure to clients. North Carolina real estate license law recognizes designated agency agents as exclusively representing their clients. See, the benefit is to the seller and buyer because if the firm offers designated dual, they're getting exclusive representation again that they won't get in dual. There's two exceptions to when the firm can't offer designated. A broker cannot be a designated agent if he or she is aware of confidential information about the other client. Second, the broker in charge cannot be a designated agent opposite a provisional broker under his or her supervision. That's the two situations that if they exist, the firm can't allow designated agency. So this exception between the broker in charge and a provisional broker under her supervision, they can't do the transaction in designated. They could close the transaction in dual. They can, they'll have to stay in dual. So they won't be able to advocate on behalf of anybody. Broker in charge and another broker in the firm, no problem. Provisional broker and another broker in the firm, no problem. It's only when one of the clients is represented by the broker in charge and the other clients represented by a provisional broker under that fixed supervision. So in designated dual agency, the firm and all the affiliated agents in the firm remain dual agents. It's only the agent that's with the buyer that's designated to represent the buyer and only the agent that took the listing that's designated to represent the seller. The firm itself and everybody else in the firm, no matter how many they are, are still dual, still representing both equally. The designated only affects the people actually working with the buyer and seller. Now, if you flip over to 52, I've got some diagrams I hope will help you further understand what we're working with here. Three ways firm can engage in dual agency. Number one, the firm through one of its affiliated brokers represents a buyer client and a seller client, the same transaction, okay? So we've got the real estate company, we've got one affiliated broker and she has both clients, seller and buyer. That's dual agency. Pretty straightforward. Number two, the firm through two of its affiliated brokers represents a buyer client, a seller client, the same transaction. Now, remember the key here is 
the agreements are between the buyer and the firm, between the seller and the firm, not with the individual agents. Also recognize something else, okay, if you're looking at the screen. Broker number one also represents the seller and broker number two also represents the buyer. That's what dual agency is. Number three, the firm through two of its affiliated brokers, one in the firm's main office and one in the firm's branch office. So they're two different offices, but they're owned by the same firm. And see, if you're in a rural area, you're probably not used to that. So let me share this. I was affiliated with a firm in Charlotte that had 18 offices in Mecklenburg County. And this is 25 years ago. They had 18 offices in Mecklenburg County. The same man owned the company and all 18 offices. And he's not around, but his company's still around, Alan Tate. The point I'm making is I was in one of those 18 offices. If I wrote an offer on a listing listed by any one of those 18 offices, that was dual agency. Because all 18 offices were under the firm, same firm license. They were the same company. And again, each broker, even though they're in the same offices, represents the other client. Number one, the woman represents the sellers, and number two, the guy represents the buyers. Everybody represents everybody. That's what dual agency is. Now, most real estate transactions, not all, most real estate transactions are in cooperative brokerage. Cooperative brokerage. Realtor slang is co-broke, okay? Stands for cooperative brokerage. Two different real estate firms. One firm holds the listing and they represent the seller. The firm that represents the seller is called the listing firm or the seller's firm. One firm brings the buyer. They usually represent the buyer, but it's possible to be a sub-agent of the seller. We'll talk more about that next week. We don't have time to get into it this week. Now, the firm that brings the buyer is called the selling firm. And you need to remember that. You need to get comfortable with that because that's the way it's going to be on the exam. The real estate commission's terminology for the broker or the firm that brings a buyer to a transaction has always been the selling firm. The firm that has the listing is either the listing firm or seller's firm, not selling, I-N-G. Dual agency is impossible in a co-broke transaction. It's two different companies. Each party to the transaction has their own firm. So in other words, this is a Caldwell Banker agent brings a buyer to a REMAX listing. A Century 21 agent brings a buyer to a KW listing. Two different real estate firms. Dual agency is impossible. 
the firms will split the brokerage fee, share the commission, usually through the MLS. Now, I use the word split because that's what they do. Do not take from that it's 50-50. It might be, it might not be. But there, in other words, there is no set amount that the split is. It's whatever the listing firm decides to do. So I didn't want you to get the impression that I was saying it was going to be split in half. The compensation should be confirmed if firms are not members of an MLS. Now, if you join a real estate firm in most of the real estate markets, you will be in the MLS, your firm will be in the MLS, and all of this will be handled through the MLS. It is unusual, not unheard of, but unusual to have a transaction with another agent who actually isn't a member of MLS. I didn't say it can't happen, but it's unusual. So Cobro transaction, ABC Realty listed this home for those sellers. They have a listing agreement with those sellers. ABC is the agent of the sellers. Their affiliated broker is a sub-agent. And again, only pictured one because I didn't want to clear up the screen. It could be 200. There's no limit to the affiliated brokers. And at the same time, XYZ Realty has a buyer agency agreement with a buyer client. XYZ is the agent of the buyer. And the broker working with the buyer is a sub-agent, okay? And that buyer is taking to this seller and they put a deal together. That's co-bro, two different firms, cooperative brokerage. Okay, I went 15 minutes or a little more yesterday. I'm just going to go a few minutes more longer today. Again, we're trying to make up that time from last week. Exclusive agency. Exclusive agency. Each firm exclusively represents their principal, be it the seller or buyer. An exclusive seller agency firm cannot represent buyers. An exclusive buyer agency firm cannot represent sellers. In other words, most firms today are not practicing exclusive agency. They don't want to do that. They want to be able to represent both. Why do they want to be able to represent both? More money. Yeah, make more money. Okay, that's the truth. It doesn't benefit the consumer. It benefits the real estate firm. Okay. Sub-agency, the firm that brings a buyer customer is acting as a sub-agent of the listing firm and their seller. Now, I'm, in my attempt to get you to wrap your brain around this, to understand it, I'm gonna explain this a couple different ways. This is a situation where we've got two different brokers and the two different brokers are in different companies. This would be co-broke. It is a co-broke transaction. But for whatever reason, the agent with the buyer is not a buyer agent. For whatever reason, and, and I know it's gonna be hard for you to do, but try not to get hung up on the fact that they're not a buyer agent. They're not a buyer agent, okay? So earlier I said to you in North Carolina, you can't be neutral, you must have a client. So if they're bringing a buyer and showing them this listing and they're not a buyer agent, they have to represent the seller. They have no choice. North Carolina law forces that on them. 
So that will make this agent a sub-agent of the seller. The buyer is a pure customer. They're unrepresented, they're on their own. Now, if you're wondering why that would ever happen, and it is very rare, but I've seen it happen recently. The only reason this happens is because the buyer said, I don't want buyer agency. That's how this happens. And I've seen this happen twice in the last several years. Buyer came to a real estate company, hooked up with one of their agents, and early in that discussion told this agent, you can show me properties and you can write the offer and you can make the commission, but I don't want you to represent me. I don't want buyer agency. That forces that agent to be a sub-agent of the seller, no matter what. And that's the situation we're talking about. So the buyer is a third party or customer. They're unrepresented. They're on their own. The listing firm and seller would have what's called vicarious liability for this since that agent with the buyer is actually representing them, the listing firm and seller. I know that's a lot. And we'll talk about this more next week. If you're wondering why a buyer would do that, there's a reason. About 20 years ago, somebody published a white paper, a position paper, okay, on the internet. And it's like four paragraphs long, and it's all the reason if you're a buyer, you should never, never agree to work with a buyer agent. Okay. It's bunk, but that doesn't matter. If it's on the internet, it must be true, right? But seriously, every once in a while, somebody still runs across this dude. You know, they do a Google search. And you know how sometimes you do a Google search and something pops up and you start reading it, you think it's, it's recent, it's current, and then you find a date in it somewhere and the stupid thing's 14 years old or something. Well, every once in a while, somebody stumbles on this paper and they read it and they believe it. So they are not going to be a, let anybody be a buyer agent with that. I mean, it says everything bad about buyer agents. The only thing it doesn't say is it's a communist plot, but that's kind of subliminal in it. Yeah, that's just, it is what it is. Okay. And every once in a while, we'll run into one of these people and they're adamant. We will know we're not going to work with a buyer agent. Uh, hex on you. And that's how this happens. Okay. So co-broke looks like this, okay? Two different companies. ABC has the listing. ABC and the affiliate broker represent the seller. XYZ and the affiliated broker have this buyer, but the buyer is a customer. So XYZ does not represent the buyer, XYZ, is forced to represent the seller and the listing firm. That makes them a sub-agent of the seller and ABC Realty buyers a customer. And that's the graphic on the bottom of 53. So you've got those two graphics there. Okay. So seller sub-agency means one of them has a buyer, but they don't represent the buyer. Now, compensation, pay, money, okay? Compensation is not dependent on or connected to agency relationships. 
who you represent and who pays you don't have anything to do with each other. Okay, that's a fact. And I know some people have a hard time dealing with that, but I can't help that. There is no connection. Okay. The firms have either agreed to cooperate and compensate each other in a written agreement through MLS, or if there is no MLS, they have entered into a compensation agreement between them. But who they pay and how much they pay has nothing to do with who they represent. Agency relationships and leasing, generally the same as sales. The parties are the landlord owner instead of seller owner and the other parties a tenant instead of a buyer. The firm may represent the landlord as a property manager and the tenant as a third party customer. Now in the larger urban markets, in the cities, Charlotte, Raleigh, Greensboro, probably Greenville, there are firms that actually will represent tenants in leasing property. Just like a buyer hires a buyer agent, a prospective tenant can hire the real estate firm to find them the rental they're looking for. That's actually done a lot in those markets in commercial leasing. Okay. Uh, so today there's three ways to work with sellers. This isn't in the book, okay? The firm can be a seller's agent, which is the same as a listing agent. The firm can be a dual agent or they can be in designated dual. There's three ways firms can work with buyers, a buyer's agent, dual agent or designated dual. Pretty straightforward there. Agency disclosure, okay? And I'm just gonna introduce this because we won't have time to get through it, but we can get the basics of it. Remember I said in 1995, we got mandatory agency disclosure. We were required to tell everybody who we represented. That's what agency disclosure is, okay? All agents must disclose who they represent which party they owe their allegiance to. In all sales transactions, in all 50 states and Canada. This isn't something that's unique to North Carolina. The only thing that is unique to each state is what the written disclosure actually looks like, what the paper looks like, okay? So how do we disclose? We deliver the working with real estate agents disclosure. Now, you're going to have to be a little proactive here because the disclosure just changed. So in the book, this is under how, number one, the working with real estate agents change brochure to disclosure. It used to be a fold up brochure. It is not anymore, it's a piece of paper. So change brochure to disclosure. Number two, review it with prospective sellers and buyers. And number three, determine who the agent will represent. Now, in the next line, the first bullet, all agents must give and review the scratch out brochure. It's disclosure now. With all sellers and buyers required in all sales transactions, residential and commercial. So the only kind of transaction that doesn't require this written disclosure is leasing. You're not required to give the disclosure if you do leasing. But in all sales, you do, both residential and commercial. And then finally, the last bullet in this section, 
Again, it says the brochure is not required at least transactions change, change brochure to disclosure. And we're gonna do that throughout here. Okay, change brochure to disclosure everywhere you find it. When do we disclose? First substantial contact, you see that in big bold print, first substantial contact. Well, what in blazes is first substantial contact? The point at which the agent is about to receive confidential information. That's what first substantial contact is. Now, in your book, it's worded a little differently before receiving or asking for confidential information, same thing. Usually that happens when we start talking about their specific housing needs. Because if nothing else, you're gonna to have to talk about money, right? Price range. So you, you do the disclosure before you get into that discussion, okay? Now, this first substantial contact thing is a deadline. It doesn't say you have to wait till then. You just do it before you get there. And see, I always did it as soon as I could. I wanted to get it out of the way so I didn't have to worry about it. First substantial contact can occur before an agent meets the consumer as when they are contacted by an out-of-town buyer wishing to see properties. And this is all in that win section. In order for the agent to arrange the showings, they need to ask questions. What price range do you want to be in? When we search the MLS, we have to search by price range. Once again, we're at first substantial contact. So in that when section, the, brochure, the word brochure appears three times. And each time as you're going through it, actually four times, now I see it. It's going to be disclosure. First substantial contact can, can happen on the phone or by email. You would disclose verbally on the phone or disclose by email. Just attach the disclosure and send it back to them. Now, the rule still says you're supposed to mail a disclosure within three days. Nobody ever mails anything anymore, but you can certainly attach it to a email and bounce it back to them. Who do we disclose to? This one's easy. Everyone, everyone, sellers, buyers, all sales transactions. And we're going to stop right there, guys.